Okay. Here we are once again. My name is Kay Taiwo with a very exciting topic where we unpack truths and dispel error. Today, we're going to be talking about a very, very important subject because how you see Jesus determines what you make of his mission and what he says about himself. Interestingly enough, some have said that Jesus is a liberal. Think about that. Jesus is a liberal. How do you reconcile scriptures with the label, Jesus is a liberal? Do you believe that? Well, some people actually do. I remember some time ago, a pastor made the assertion that Jesus is a liberal. And I pushed back. I pushed back because I said, it. I actually said, this is an insult to look at Jesus from the labels of politics because Jesus obviously transcends politics. So to put a label based on your political leanings on the Savior is to demean and diminish why he came. And he, all you need to do, don't look far at all. Look at Jesus himself, how he dealt with the people of his day. And you will know that Jesus cannot be subject or be confined to labels such as liberal, Democrat, Republican. These are world systems. And Jesus did not come to establish a worldly kingdom. He came to bring the kingdom of God to make it accessible to people on earth. So it is a fallacy to even dare think to call Jesus a liberal, a progressive, and more importantly, what we need to do is see Jesus from the light of in light of his mission and also from the scripture. What did he come to do? What did God send Jesus into the world to do? Obviously, John 3.16 is a very well-known verse that says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The next verse in 17 says that God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, or that through him the world might be saved. That is the mission of Jesus. So why would we confine him to a label? Now, there was a site called churchtimesco.uk. John Arnold uh, recalls in churchtimesco.uk of a German professor. He says about this German professor, I remember Ernest Caseman during a particularly fraught debate in the World Council of Churches striding to the microphone and saying forcefully in German, one of the few things which can be said with certainty about Jesus of Nazareth is that he was what we would now call a liberal. And he goes on to say, it is evident that when he uses the word the liberal, he's not speaking of the economics and of contemporary capitalism, which he loathes, but of liberation and indeed of liberation theology. Now, that is so preposterous to put such a label on Jesus. One, one this person is actually revealing is that they have a worldview and they're trying to fit Jesus into that worldview, even though Jesus cannot be confined to any particular world view. See, when anytime we have our biases, our biases tend to only see the things that favor our cause. And that's what we see happening here. So be careful not to see Jesus from your ideology. Make sure your ideology takes its root in scripture and not the other way around. So if you already have a formed belief, which is what an ideology is, you tend to squeeze everything through that lens of that ideology. So if it's a, a, a faulty ideology, you're going to see your world through that lens. So be careful not to allow yourself that uh, temptation to fall into that trap because it, it is a trap. Now, what is liberation theology? The definition of liberation theology by the Oxford uh, Bibliography of, uh, of, of Definitions here, it says that liberation theology generally refers to a theology applied to the core concerns of marginalized communities in need of social, political, or economic equality and justice. Now, think about that. 
What does this have to do with the Jesus of the Bible, liberation theology? And I'll, I'll repeat what it says about the definition. It says, liberation theology generally refers to a theology applied to the core concerns of marginalized communities in need of social, political, or economic equality and justice. Now, right from that definition, you don't see anything about the gospel. You don't see anything about the kingdom of God. You don't see anything about the salvation that we are supposed to preach to the poor. You see, the liberation theology is a man's is man's attempt to uh, find uh, order in society, and so you teach this theology to sort of deal with the so-called inequities that exist in our society. But is that what we're called? to do. Let's 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 take let's go further. Now the poor and the marginalized sometimes in our society, uh people that follow causes will elevate these uh inequities or social economic issues and it will be so uh much of a driving force that they don't reconcile that there may be a divergence of what the scripture says. So they, they, they see themselves so firmly in this ideology and they see nothing else outside of it. So that anytime you bring the balance or bring actually focus on what God is saying, they push it aside and they actually tell you or accuse you of not seeing the truth for what it is. Now, Matthew chapter 26, verse 6 through 13 is quite insightful. Matthew 26, 6 to 13, says, While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, uh, Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he reclined at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. They were obviously upset. They were angry. And so, it goes on to say, why this waste? This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus asks, why are you bothered this woman? She has done a beautiful deed to me. The poor you will always have with you. Now think about that. Why would Jesus make such a statement? The poor you will always have with you with you. I'm going to read on and then I'll come back to explain that. But you will not always have me. By pouring this perfume on me, she has prepared my body for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached in all the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Now, let me go back to that word. The poor, you will always have with you. What this simply means, and look at the contrast. The contrast there is that Jesus is elevating his burial and subsequent resurrection at a higher level of degree to the poor, which means the poor have been around for multiple generations, forever, let's put it that way, since man fell. So Jesus is saying that my mission to die for the world, the gospel message supersedes any needs that I, I have existed absent from knowing him as our Lord and Savior. Everything else, look at the world. Even since Jesus has died and, and, and was buried, resurrected, and is back in heaven, still we see that the poor are still with us. So it will be wrong in 2,000 years later, to elevate the needs of the poor apart from the gospel. In other words, while we should and must cater to the needs of the poor, we can't elevate the needs of the poor above the gospel. In other words, we should help the poor, but make it also a conduit to reach them with the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not to change the social, economic, uh, political system externally by 
focusing on a liberation theology. That's not our mission. We're not called to do that. That's not what Jesus was called to do. And how do I know this? Even during the time of Jesus, you can identify things as injustice. And there were factions and groups. You had the Sakurai. The Sakurai were an offshoot of the Zealots. The Sakurai were not just anti-Roman occupation. They also were uh, opposed to anyone who was Jewish that supported the Romans. So what would they do? They would uh, attack both Romans and Jews that supported the Romans. And what did they do? They called Sakurai because they hid daggers or knives underneath their robes. They will mingle in the crowd. They will slash someone, kill someone, and then bury the, the dagger and just disappear among the crowd. That was their modus operandi. And that's what they did. So they, they, they were opposed to occupation. They were opposed to oppression. This came uh, later out of the zealous. The zealous were there during the time of Jesus. In fact, Jesus, one of Jesus' disciples is identified as a zealot. But Jesus did not look at his mission in that light. He did not engage directly with the Romans. Do you notice that? He came to speak and preach and proclaim a message, but he didn't come into direct conflict with the Romans. He was given an opportunity time and time again, for example, where they tried to trap him about taxes. And he said, should we give pay taxes, tribute to Caesar? Jesus said, give unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and to God that which is God's. In other words, Jesus's mission was separate and apart from the Romans kingdom. Yes, that was not his kingdom. It wasn't his, he had to establish a, a political kingdom, a political system. In fact, Judas saw Jesus as for potentially a revolutionary that could come and overthrow the Roman kingdom. But that was not Jesus's mission. His mission was to bring the good news to a world that was in need of it spiritually. And so to say Jesus was a liberal is an insult to the Jesus of the Bible. To say Jesus was a Democrat or Republican or whatever label you want to call it, it's an insult. Jesus is far above. The Bible says his name was raised far above every other name. It's above any kingdom. It's above any social structure, any system that we know today. So let's not use a label on Jesus and then go in to a tangent and get distracted off of what we're supposed to be focused on. So Jesus said that the Paul you will always have with you, indicating that that was not his main mission. It's part of what he took care of. He took care of the poor, but that's not our main assignment. Our main assignment is to stay focused on preaching of the message of the gospel. If that is not your focus, then you are in error. It's just that simple. Now let's go on to more examples. Look at Jesus at the cross. That's a very interesting um, scenario that, co that comes out of that experience of Jesus at the cross. Actually, before he went to the cross, there was another man that was put up as a trade-off. In other words, we will take Barabbas, his name is, for Jesus. Crucify Jesus, give us Barabbas. That's what the Jews are wanting. And guess why they did that? Up until a certain point, Jesus was well loved by the masses, but at some point they thought that Jesus would be the revolutionary to overthrow the Roman Empire. And if you remember when they welcomed him, we know it, we know it as Palm Sunday, they welcomed him, they uh, shouted Hosanna to Jesus as he came in on the donkey into Jerusalem. But later on, they now probably got disillusioned like this Jesus is not about revolution. He's talking about a kingdom that is different on a different uh, vein or in a different sphere than with what we anticipate. I, that's what disappointment is about. Disappointment is not based on what you expect to find. Disappointment is based on what you are not expecting to find. So if you raise your expectation and you find something else, that's your degree of disappointment. So they were disappointed 
that Jesus did not embrace what they wanted. So since they had no further use for Jesus, they said, give us Barabbas. Now, quite, something quite interesting about Barabbas is that his name itself is quite uh, enlightening. Barabbas means son of the father, son of the father. Some uh, ancient uh, translations or historians actually say that the, the first name of Barabbas was actually Jesus. So Jesus, son of the father, is put against Jesus of Nazareth, the son of man, the son of God. But what did, who did the people pick? They picked Barabbas over Jesus. They picked Barabbas for this reason. Let me read why they picked Barabbas. According to Ray Stedman, all the gospel writers tell us of Barabbas. He was a bloodthirsty revolutionary, hard-nosed and bloody-handed. He was a murderer. The interesting thing about him is his name, which means son of the father. And in most dramatic historic coincidence, according to the same old, uh, sorry, according to some old manuscripts, there is some evidence that his name probably was Jesus Barabbas, Jesus the son of the father. Now, uh, Mark 15 verse 15 reads, wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to death. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. So we see that Barabbas was a revolutionary, one who actually did the bidding of the, the fellow revolutionaries, the zealots that wanted to overthrow the Roman Empire because the Roman Empire was uh, a stain on the dignity of Israel. So they wanted to... They saw themselves as a political force to overthrow and restore dignity to Israel. But Jesus had a different path. And when they no longer saw the use for what Jesus was about, they said, give us Barabbas. Give us the bloodthirsty revolutionary. He fits the bill for our agenda. So that's quite interesting. 